Okay, so good evening. And uh, this, I, I live in the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands they have a word for this, they call this um, Kazelik, and, and it's Dutch for, but it doesn't actually translate into anything in English. So the closest you'll come to it is cozy, and like really homely. So this is what I always say with a group like this, this is really Kazelik. Cozy, homely, nice, and you know, and, and cozy, and everyone's going to enjoy it and, be, and have more personal interaction with what we're going to talk about tonight. This is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I'm here to talk to you on behalf of the University of Limerick, the Limerick Festival of Science, and of course, this week it is Science Week all over Ireland. And I am a huge superhero fan, massive superhero fan. I'm also a scientist. But before I tell you a little bit more about myself and about all this amazing science in, that's there inside the superheroes, I'm going to show you this. Okay, so that was the extended trailer for Captain America Civil War, which was out earlier this year. Now that film made $1.1 billion at the box office. It is the 12th highest grossing film of all time. And just to put it in perspective, Minions is the film that's above it in 11th, and then you go Iron Man 3. Now that film is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is owned by Disney, and has connections, of course, with Marvel. And that universe has made more than ten and a half billion dollars worldwide. This is how popular and how big this genre of film has become. It's absolutely huge. Now, what I have given everybody is this picture round, okay? And on top of that round, you find all of the, the six films, the six superhero films that appeared this year. So there's Deadpool, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, Captain America Civil War, X-Men Apocalypse, Suicide Squad, and the new film that's out at the moment in the cinema, Doctor Strange. So what you have is six films, and then there are 15 characters. So just take a moment. If you've seen all the films, great. If you haven't, it's no problem. Have a look through them and see if you can match up the film that those characters appeared in this year. Now, some of the characters appeared in more than one film, and some of the characters on this list didn't appear in any of them. So there's always a, a little bit of a technicality there. So just have a quick look, go through them, and see what you know. And as I say, you don't have to have seen all of these. You can make quite good guesses on some of them. And I see some people already asking for help. <laughs> okay. 
Bernie, you've seen this already. I haven't. You did. We did this. In all, we did this yesterday. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the tactic. <laughs> 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 oh, sure. <laughs> I'm going to watch these films in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah. You have to. Yeah, you spare weekend. That's what you need. Find a spare weekend and sit down and watch all of them. <laughs> Anybody seen all of these films this year? Anyone seen all of them? You've seen them all? Yeah? It's all right. And you've seen them all as well? Yeah. Good man. No problem at all, I'd say. I uh, I tend to watch these multiple times. So the Avengers from 2012, I've seen that film more than 40 times. That's not how I see it. It's called research, because every time you watch it, you see something you didn't see the first time, or the 15th time, or the 21st time. And the 40th. And the 40th time, I'm still seeing things that I haven't seen. And I've seen Captain America: Civil War maybe 15 times, and I'm still seeing things and catching on to things. And it's the little details. That's what I'm looking for. And um, you see things that, I'm not saying that they, they could improve, but certain things that would be, could be benef benefited or made a little bit better, make the experience a bit better for the viewer. But, yeah. but I'm a huge hero, super fan anyway, so I'm going to watch them and still enjoy it. OK, so I'm going to go through them, because well, what you'll find is that, uh, you know, OK, yeah, now I see this one is in, in that film, and then I can, by process of elimination. So the first character here we have is the Falcon. Okay, does anybody know what film he was in this year? Yes? Civil War. He was in Civil War. He was, and he's on the poster. He's right there on the poster. Okay, so the second one, Doctor Strange, which is in cinemas right now and is brilliant. If you haven't seen it, go, go see it. Visually, it is really impressive. So what film was he in? Doctor Strange. He was in Doctor Strange, <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Does anyone know her name? Anybody? Do you know her name? No? Forget it, it's a really strange name. Negasonic Teenage Warhead. That's her name. Or Sinead O'Connor. Yeah, or, or Sinead, or as she's referred in the film, Sinead O'Connor. Uh, by, by what, what film did she appear in? Anybody know? Deadpool. He was, she was in Deadpool, yeah. So Deadpool refers to her as Sinead O'Connor in the film. But also, her name comes from a song from a metal band. I don't know the name of the band. But so when they were coming up with the character, whoever came up with him, came up with her, sorry, that was the name that was given to this character. This is, of course, the Joker. And what film did the Joker appear in this year? Suicide Squad. He was in Suicide Squad. Now, anybody know who this is? He is the whole. It's Bruce Banner. You know all this as well, yeah. So now, Bruce Banner, which film did he appear in this year? He did brilliant. He didn't appear in any of them. But technically speaking, he does appear in archive footage in Captain America Civil War. So in the trailer I showed you, they showed bits of New York getting destroyed, and he's, you see him jumping from building to building. So technically he's in the film, but it's, it's a computer-generated character, of course, yeah. But not actually this guy himself, but the character. Thor. Anybody know what film he might have been, or was he in any films this year? Have you seen Doctor Strange? No, I want to. So... He's in Doctor Strange. Um, I hope I didn't ruin that for anyone, but I'm not going to tell you why. I'm not going to tell you why or how he's in Doctor Strange, but he's in Doctor Strange. Number, well, this one I don't know the number, but this one is Wonder Woman. Anybody know what film she was in? Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Batman. What film was he in? Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Dawn of Justice. He was also in Suicide Squad. Excellent. He was in both of those, yeah. Fantastic. Anybody know who this guy is? I don't know his name, but I know he appeared in Civil War. He's in Civil War. His name is Helmut Zemo. He's the main villain. And he's brilliant. Because this guy has no superpowers. At all. But yet, as a supervillain, he was able to create, let's say, a large problem for all the Avengers, Iron Man and Captain America, with all their superpowers. This is Wolverine, he's one of my favourite characters 
in all of the films. And his last film, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, is next year called Logan. But what film was he in? Apocalypse. He's in Apocalypse. X-Men yeah. Apocalypse. 20, 20 seconds. I'd say two minutes. I'd say maybe not 20 seconds. A little bit longer. We'll say between two, 20 seconds and two minutes. Yeah? We'll agree to disagree. Um, anybody know what film this guy appeared in? Anyone know his name? Anybody? His name is Crossbones, and he was in, you know. I, the, I, I've never seen it, so I don't know, but I feel like Deadpool. He wasn't in Deadpool, no. He's in Civil War. He's the, he's the first bad guy they encounter in Civil War. Uh, this is Nick Fury. What film was Nick Fury in this year? Anybody? He wasn't in Civil War. So, so that probably means he was in nothing. He didn't appear in any films this year, uh, which is kind of a surprise. Uh, Scarlet Witch, Civil War, Civil War. Cyclops, X-Men Apocalypse. Apocalypse, and the last one, does anyone know who that is? Spider-Man. Is, is it Spider-Man? No. no. This is Eric, the actor Erza Miller. He's playing Barry Allen, or also known as The Flash, who appeared in... Anybody know? He's in Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, yeah. And he's also in Suicide Squad for about 10 seconds. What does he do there? He captures Captain Boomerang while he's in a bank, robbing a bank. So he, it's, these are the little details. That's the details I look for, okay? That's, that's, what, that's where I'm at. Fair time. <laughs> you have me here. It's the rest of his yeah. Yes. <laughs> Now, I'm here today to talk about superheroes and talk about superpowers and actually having them in the future because we are going to have superpowers in the future. And that's why what the message I want to get across to you right now tonight is that some of you could use them, some of you could actually be the people who are making them. And guess what? You're going to make them for me. Thanks. Because I don't have enough time in the day to be able to do it myself and it would be great for other people out there to take the baton and run with it. So that's what I'm hoping happens tonight. So I've been dreaming about having superpowers since I was a kid. And most times I tell people this, uh, now that I'm an adult, they think that I'm absolutely crazy. But then I back it up and say, well, you know what, I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher. I was at University of Limerick, and now I work in the Netherlands. I live in Eindhoven, so if you're anyone into football, you know PSV Eindhoven plays, there, plays out of Eindhoven. The stadium is about a kilometer from my apartment. And I work in Delft University of Technology, and I've worked in many different areas of science. I've worked in, and I have to actually look at a little bit of chemistry, some physics, some biology, biomedical physics. And through all my research and all the re the, the, my research career, I started to realize that there's a lot of real science happening right now, all around the world, that could be used in the future to create superpowers. Now, in my opinion, we stand in this cinematic superhero revolution that started in 2000 with the very first X-Men film. That was the first one that saw Hugh Jackman, who was a completely unknown actor at the time, playing Logan or Wolverine for the very first time. Now, that film was made for about $70 million. It made about three, 360 or 370 million worldwide, and it was deemed to be a success, and it certainly was, and it set the precedence for all the films that came after that. Now, I don't want to forget about Batman and Superman, the Batman films from the 90s, and Superman films from the 80s and 70s, how many people here, hands up, have seen Superman from 1978? It's a, it's a select, it's a very select few. Now, now, if you haven't seen it, please do. Now, the plot is, I think the plot's great. The special effects aren't there, so you can clearly see he's not flying. But, but watch it for what it is, and watch it for the story that it is. It's a great story. Yes? Um, I watched this program a while ago, and it showed that in one of the older Batmans, they did this thing where they were climbing up the wall sideways, and they tilted the cameras. They That's exactly, yeah, so that was the Batman series. When they were climbing up the wall, what they actually were doing was, they were walking normally, like this. Uh, along, along the ground, like here, they just pretended they were walking along the side of the building. And the person who came out the window to ask them why they were climbing the building, they were the one who was hanging inside the set, so that they, didn't, so that they could actually go out and talk to them. Because that was the easiest way to do it. That's how they filmed it. Yeah, exactly. Um, now these are some of the films that came out in this in this cinematic superhero revolution this year, 
and in Batman vs. Superman and in Captain America Civil War, they talk about similar themes. It's all about managing superpowers and what happens when people have superpowers and how do we deal with them and should we introduce laws for people when they have superpowers. And these are the things we're going to have to think about in the future because these type of laws probably will have to be introduced. And Doctor Strange introduces a completely different area, magic. It introduces the idea of being able to go into parallel worlds and, and, and to create <coughs> things out of thin air. So it's a different type of a film. Now, I'm sure people have their favorite superpower. I'm sure, you know, what's your favorite superpower? Which one do you really like right now? If I offered you a chance. Teleport. Teleport. I don't like teleportation. Yeah. How about you? What's a fly? Fly. I'm going to talk about flying in a second. Anybody else? How about you? Would you like any of it all? Would you like invisibility? Yeah. There you go, you see invisibility, yeah, right. How about an Iron Man suit? Who would like an Iron Man suit here? So you want an Iron Man suit? I mean, if you're giving them out. Yeah, if I'm giving them out, yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got three in the car, okay, and I'll give you them, I'll give, give them out later on, yeah. That's prizes. So in my opinion, there are some great, like, some great powers, but for me, Wolverine's accelerated healing is exceptional. Imagine being empty, instantly self-heal from any injury like that. But I'm really glad somebody said flying. You said flying, wasn't it? You said flying, is it? Yeah. Yep. That's number one for me. And I've tried everything to be able to fly. So I've flown a plane. Um, I'm not a pilot, but I did a couple of lessons. And first lesson, I was in the plane. And I uh, pulled back the controls a little bit too, too vigorously, a little too quickly. I was too keen to learn. And the engine, <coughs> the engine stalled. So I'm pointed this way. And next thing, I'm pointed this way. And the engine, and the plane's going down. And the, po uh, the guy who's doing the lesson with me is frantically trying to restart the engines, and he gets the engines restarted, and we're fine, everything's good. And he turns to me and says, you were very calm during this whole, whole ordeal. You know what was happening? I said, yes, I know. I stalled the engine. I said, why were you so calm? I said, you're here to fix my mistakes, because I'm just as beautiful, and you're the expert. I've also done a parachute jump. Now, anyone here like to do a parachute jump? Anyone done a parachute jump? You done one? Yeah. Where did you do it? In um, Derek, Girls Gone Oh, okay. I'm finishing the match. I'm joking. I did it. I did it awfully. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. Derry, so yeah. I think it was somewhere in. I don't think it was in Derry. It was somewhere else. I think. Burke. 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 Probably Road. Maybe. Burke. Burke. Yeah, it might have been that. Yeah. Fun below. Yeah. 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 Somewhere. I, I can't remember exactly. It was a few years ago. But um, I always tell people if anyone anyone here want to do a parachute jump. After hearing that, probably no. But anyway, yeah, yeah, definitely. So what you want to keep in mind is when you're in the plane, the door opens, okay? These are the words you want to echo in your mind. You're jumping out of a perfectly working plane that's going to land 10 minutes later. And you're doing this for the enjoyment of it. And there's nothing wrong with the plane, okay? So you're jumping out of a plane, there's no, no problem with it. But it's a great experience. I've also done a bungee jump. Anyone here done a bungee jump? Yeah, we've got a couple of bungee jumps here. So the, I'm... I mean, anyone's done any, any higher than 70 meters? I'm sure you have. Yeah, where did you do yours? I did mine in South Africa. The Probably highest one in the world. 120, 130 meters, something like that, was it? It's uh, 800 feet. 800 feet, so that's about 200, 200 meters, or more, 220, 230 yeah. meters. Wow. Well, came away three inches taller. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I can't compete with that. That's amazing. I mean, you're, you must have felt like you were falling for ages, oh. right? Yeah, well, what I did, I did it in, in uh, off a pier in uh, the Netherlands in a place called Schreveningen. It's just beside the Hague. And you go up in a, in a crane, and then the crane swings out over the North Sea, and then the, the, you're invited to jump out the, of the cage. And you can't be pushed for insurance reasons. So I was offered front, front, jump front or jump back. I said, I'll go backwards. So I edged out over the cage. I love telling the story because you all see people grimacing. And edge out over the cage. So to make sure at that point I only have my toes inside the cage. And my heels are out over the North Sea. And I'll never forget looking down, and all you see is the North Sea very much underneath your heels. And then you just have to voluntarily fall backwards. And for about a split second, I thought, this rope isn't going to work. I'm still here. All good. All great. And I do it again. It's an amazing experience. But that's all, in all of those cases, my attempt to experience flight or something like flight, I had to use technology. You know, as a scientist, I would love to see people innovating and inventing and thinking outside the box. Do I have to resort to using technology? Yes. I know most of the younger generation here would have seen the bat suits. Yeah. Guys jumping off mountains in uh, in, a or not in, a in France or mm -hmm. Germany. Yeah. yeah. Germany. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. 
200 miles an hour and yeah. they open their arms and their legs and they will bat suit it on. That's yeah. amazing. I think that would be amazing as well. I think so, yeah. I'm looking for something where a lot, basically with all of these things, what goes up must come down. So I'm looking for something that you can say, well, to, to do that, you got to get to the top of the mountain and then jump off. And then you have some level of control as you're coming down. You can maneuver it and you can and control and, and fly whatever way you want and you can dictate your speed. But I'm talking about the idea that uh, wouldn't it be great to have a, the power to be able to say, well, I'm going to fly now, I'm just going to take off from, the, from a standing position without using an Ironman suit. Okay, so I'm talking like some sort of self-propelled flight. And um, this is probably, you're thinking that's never going to happen. You're going to always need a suit. You're always, always going to need technology. But I think if we, if we, we we're very inv inventive and we've solved a lot of problems. So I think that if we put our mind to it, we probably can fix or think of something that can get us there. These are four characters who are in the superhero films. This is Storm. This is Cyclops from Deadpool. This is the Invisible Woman. This is Iron Man. Now, let's leave out Iron Man because he's built technology. These three characters here have got their powers because they have something different from everybody in this room. And that's some small little change in their DNA. So I'm sure, has everybody heard DNA before? DNA? So DNA is like a, a biological code, a barcode that everybody has. And everybody's DNA is different. And your DNA contains information about what color eyes you might have, what color hair you're going to have, how tall you might be. And it also contains genes that are used to produce proteins in your body. So we all know that there's foods that are high in protein like eggs and meat, and you're told to always eat them. And the reason you need them is because your body needs to take proteins from those foods and make other proteins with them. So the proteins we make in our body include uh, collagen, it's in our skin, and hemoglobin, stuff that's in your blood. That's the stuff that carries oxygen around the place. The reason all of these characters here from the X-Men universe have their superpowers is because they have produce proteins that we don't. And it's as simple as that. Now, that sounds like a really simple statement, but is there a solution, a scientific solution, that we could actually use to maybe engineer or build the X-Men? Is there a tool out there that we could use? And the answer is yes. And the, uh, the tool is called the CRISPR-Cas system. Now what this is, it's a genetic editing tool. And it can be used to chop up parts of your DNA. Now your DNA looks like something like this. It's like this double helix which is wrapped around itself. And what this CRISPR-Cas system actually does is it can be used to find a particular location in your DNA, cut it, and then you're left with two options. You either just cut it and your DNA will self-heal. So don't worry about destroying DNA, it'll fix itself. Or you can put another, ge another gene in there in its place. Now, why would you want to just cut it and then just let it self-heal? Well, this tool can be used to find genes associated with diseases, maybe a blood disorder or a cancer. Find that in DNA, destroy the gene, the DNA self-heals, and that cancer or blood disorder will never ever develop in the future in that particular person. But in terms of taking this tool and using it to create the X-Men, imagine if we could identify the superpower genes behind Wolverine or behind Cyclops, and we found these genes, and we took this CRISPR-Cas system and cut our DNA at a certain location, and you just slot the gene in. And then you could start building and actually engineering superheroes in a laboratory. And imagine we were able to create this guy. So this is Cyclops in X-Men Apocalypse. And he opens his eyes and this is what he can do. So you might think, that is incredible. How are we, I mean, that's, that's never going to happen. My grandfather found that he was five years old. But I look at it from this perspective. I, I swing from the branches myself. The only thing you have to change is associate with his eyes. I mean, that's probably my favorite. Now, of course, this is, the, this is like the extreme. But imagine you could adjust someone's eyesight that they no longer just see in the visible, visible spectrum, that they could also see infrared, or that they could also see ultraviolet. I mean, that's something that could be done. This is the absolute and utter extreme, but you never know where science could bring us. But where it's been used at the moment is with modifying crops and modif modifying other species. Because when it comes to using something like the CRISPR-Cas system to modify people, you're going to need a lot of red tape. A lot of people are going to say, don't think you can do this. You need ethics for this. And that's very important. So when you go to do this, it's absolutely crucial that you get full ethical approval, full financial support from funding agencies, that you have the backing of society. Society wants to see this. And 
you know, there'll be constant and there will be a lot of debate and there is constantly debate about how this system could be used when, when it comes to human DNA. But that hasn't stopped it being used already and applied to other, other DNA strands. For example, there's a group in the, in the United States have taken this CRISPR-Cas system and modified mushrooms so they never go brown. So if you go to a store, you buy these mushrooms, they're always white. So how do you tell if they've gone off? Then you really got to read the best before data, right? And then you have these guys here, which is a very recent study. What they wanted to do is they wanted to see if fins in fish and legs in mice, when they grow, are they activated by the same gene? They wanted to see if it's the same gene at play. So they used the CRISPR-Cas system to modify a particular sequence in both of the DNA of, of a mouse and a fish, so that when, when that gene was activated, they, that part of the body would glow. And that's exactly what they found here. So this is the mouse's foot as it's growing, and this is the fin of the fish as it's growing, and they found that, well, we can see that this particular gene is the one that's active in both cases. What does this mean? Well, there's a link then between mice and how their limbs grow, and fish and how their fins grow. And maybe there's some, if they could trace it back, distant evolutionary connection between these two, and that they actually split at some point. Now, the other thing about this is that they've actually used this, this amazing technology to change the DNA of zebrafish so that instead of growing fins, the zebrafish grow limbs. So that's what they've actually used this as well to do. So it's incredibly powerful what they can do with this technology. This is another character that's, that really, for me, is amazing. This is, this is a guy called The Vision. He's in Age of Ultron. And this is his birth. So you've seen in this scene the birth of a superhero. And he is probably the most powerful superhero in the Avengers. He is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And he's, you know, he could easily defeat all of them if he wanted to. Now, this is him meeting Thor and a couple of, of the other, other heroes that are there. But he's made of three main things, okay? He's made of living cells. Everybody in this room is made of biological cells, living cells, millions and millions of cells, and different types, kidney cells, skin cells, blood cells. He's also got vibranium inside him. Does anyone know what, where the vibranium is coming from? Have they heard of vibranium before? Anybody? Anybody know? It's in Captain America's shield, yeah. Now, Captain America's shield is made with a vibranium. That material doesn't exist. Um, it's not real. It's not radioactive either. Um, well, actually, they found, they found four brand new elements for the periodic table uh, at the end of uh, just the start of this year. Now, they've all already named. Well, I was really fingers crossed. I was hoping one of them was going to be named vibranium. I really have to. I mean, one of them, they wanted to also name another one after Lemmy from Motorhead. Um, that was another suggestion from somebody after because he had passed away around the same time. But I really was hoping vibranium, but it hasn't. And the last thing that he's made of is an infinity stone. It's one of these gems that are in the film. So you, some of you have seen some of the Marvel films, and there's a lot of these gems and, and mystical stones that are after. Because in 2018, a film called Infinity War is going to come out. And it's going to have all of the Avenger characters, Spider-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, all fight against one guy, Thanos. He's the big, big chief villain in all of this. And that film, I think the budget is $1 billion for that film. That's what they're going to put into this. That's how confident Disney are that this is going to be a success. Now, in my opinion, they say that he was, he was made inside this cradle. I don't think he was made in a cradle or he was built in a cradle. I think he was actually 3D printed. So the vision is a 3D printed person or android. Now, you've all probably heard of 3D printing, right? Yeah? And has anyone ever used a 3D printer? Anyone ever seen one in action? Yeah? You've seen one in action, yeah? It's quite slow, right? Yeah. Yeah? It depends on which one it is, but it can take some time. And this is one of them. It's called fused deposition modeling. So how does it work? So you have a roll of your material. This is your plastic. And it goes up here on the top of the printer, comes through to this point, and then it gets heated or melted. And at that point, then, it's squeezed out through a nozzle. So when you're using your toothpaste, you squeeze toothpaste out of your tube onto your toothbrush. It goes through the nozzle, and then it makes the shape of whatever that nozzle is. It's exactly the same process here. It's like the nozzle in your, in your toothbrush. It's squeezed then onto, the, onto, the, um, onto this build platform, they call it. So this object has almost been built. It looks like it's a pillar. And it's then squeezed in a certain, a certain pattern. 
And you can use 3D printers to build so many things, chess pieces, art. They've even used 3D printers to make prosthetics. So artificial hands for people who unfortunately have, have lost the, their hands due to some accident. And for children in particular, they've actually made prosthetics with 3D printers for less than 50 euros that look like the Iron Man gauntlet glove. So they actually look like Iron Man's glove. I think it's incredible and it's amazing what people and ingenuity people have shown with this technology. Now, I, I as you probably have realized if you've looked at the back, I've written a couple of books. One of these books is about superheroes. And I've written a second book this year about Santa Claus. Okay, now, in my opinion, Santa Claus, a number that you hear a lot, you're going to hear this in the next six weeks, is the number of homes that Santa Claus has to visit <coughs> in one second. And you'll hear 3,000 per second. In my opi scientific opinion, that is impossible. But it is possible for him to do it if he does the following. If he gets some help, and this is exactly what he does, he gets help. And he uses a 3D bioprinter to print copies or clones of himself. So what he does is he has these helper Santa Clauses who actually go all around the world and they meet people before Christmas, meet, meet children before Christmas Eve, then they go back to the Arctic workshops and together with Santa Claus they fly out and deliver the presents together. This means he cuts down the number of homes he has to visit from 3,000 per second to maybe one per one or two seconds. So it's, it's much more doable. Now, the idea of 3D printing an entire person may sound like it's never going to happen. Well, I think it actually will. You know, it might happen in our lifetime, within the next 10 years, within the next 15 years. This is a 3D bioprinter. It's called ITOP, Integrated Tissue Organ Printer or pr Production. And this actually prints ears. It prints muscle. It prints bones. It prints ligaments. It prints tendons. And it can also be used to print organs or parts of organs, like kidneys. So this is an example how it was used to print an ear. So it takes an MRI scan of, you first do an MRI scan of an ear, so you, get, you figure out what it looks like. You then do a computer model. Then you break this model into layers. You print it. And then once the ear has grown a little, you can then implant it. Now, I'm going to show you this in action. So this is the very same 3D printer. This, the 3D bioprinter. This is 100% real. And what they do, first of all, is they have, they'll stop it here. This is a hydrogel. So anyone here use hair gel? I use hair gel. Anybody here use hair gel? So every day when you use hair gel, you're using hydrogel, actually. It's basically water with some polymers or particles in there, which kind of gets your, gets your style. I like to have my style as good as I can, you know, while I still have hair. And it then, in here, what it does is it, it lays a, a template, a sacrificial template. What that basically is, is it's like a scaffold. And it's like a scaffold that you have around bu a building when you're building a building at the start. This is the cells getting placed inside this scaffold. This is the cells being printed into this particular scaffold. Now, the scaffold itself is biodegradable. It's non-toxic. So after some time, it will vanish. And this then speeds up a little bit here as it's starting to print the rest of the, rest of the ear. And this whole process could take maybe one to two hours for this whole thing to take place. And not only does it print this scaffold, it also prints microchannels because you can't bioprint blood vessels. But so in that case, it prints temporary microchannels, which act as blood vessels that can bring oxygen and water to the cells to keep them alive. And there you have an entire ear. Now, where could this also be used? Well, I can tell you right now that the kidney is the most transplanted organ on the planet. Now, if somebody unfortunately is suffering from kidney disease or failed organs, failed kidneys, they have two choices of action. It's either dialysis for an extended period of time, or, and that could take, could, could lead to five, six hours sit, sitting and, and waiting to get dialysis, or you get, you're lucky enough to get a, a donor, and you get a donor transplant. Um, but then, if you get a donor, you have to also take drugs to stop your body from rejecting the organ. What if you could, in the future, take cells from your body, if, for example, you had the, an, an unfortunate uh, uh, condition where you had some issues with your kidney, and you could use those cells to print a brand new kidney. That's where this is going to go. This is not an if, this is a win. This is what these people are actually working on, and it's absolutely incredible. Now, I've got a question for everyone, open question. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody have an idea? Fingerprint? Who said that? Yeah, straight down the back. Yeah, that is a fingerprint. And this was taken with a, a high, highly powerful microscope. 
And I have some friends in the, in the Netherlands who are, who are, they're researchers, they're involved in this bioprinting, but they're also involved in bio art. And what they do is they take microscopic images of fingerprints and other parts, other cells in your body, and they produce and they produce art. So if you want to get this done, all you got to do is send them a sample. They'll put it under a microscope. They then will color it, and they produce this amazing image. And their company is called Four Blue Cells. But does anybody want to guess at how much this actually costs to, to print to actually do it? Because they're using these microscopes. They use are they call them the Ferrari of microscopes half a million euros for a, te for a microscope. If you want to get this done, you're looking at about 1,000, 1,500 euros. For, and, but, and it's art, and that's what they call it. They see it as art. And they've had people buy this stuff and put it in their living rooms. So if you walked into someone's house and they had pictures of their fingerprints on the walls, like this, would you think that was strange? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. think it was weird? Well, I was actually thinking of getting, getting a non joke and I'm not, I'm not I, can't, I can't afford that. Um, now, the other, another one they can do, this is another fingerprint, but this is another one they've done. Does anyone know what these red things are here? Okay. I'm not saying this, no? Anyone? Nanobots. Sorry? Nanobots. Not nanobots. It's something from your body. Everyone's got them in their body. They, yeah? Red blood cells. cells. Hair cells. Red blood cells. Oh. They are red blood cells. So they take red blood cells, again, from a sample from someone's blood. They extract them. They place them on these. Just, just some sort of structure. They take a magnified image and they produce these amazing images. Now, why am I showing you these? Because this is the scale that we've got to look at. This is the scale we've got to change if we want to create the X-Men. This is the scale that we've got to control if we want to be able to bioprint organs or if we want to bioprint a complete person or create the vision because this is where we need to operate. Now, if you're not willing to wait for that bio answer, I'm going to give you a couple more, couple more ways to get superpowers. Okay? This is Colossus. And what he has is, if you don't know the character, he has an organic steel layer around his skin that protects his skin, his organs, and his bones. And in the comic books in 1975, when the character was written, the guy said, let's just make it organic steel. I can tell you right now, it's not steel. Um, definitely not. But there is a material that exists right now that would give us this, this perfect solution for it. And part of the solution is actually contained in pencils. And you might think, hold on a minute, pencils? They break really easily. But we're not talking about pencils themselves. We're talking about the atoms in pencils. That's carbon. Now, carbon you also find in coal. And you also find carbon in diamonds. You can also find carbon in graphene. And what graphene is, it's a single layer of carbon atoms. Carbon atom is about, is about a billionth of a meter in thickness. Incredibly, incredibly small. And they have arranged these atoms in a very particular configuration. It looks like this what they call a hexagonal, so that, that each, of the, uh, each of the atoms is touching three other, three other carbon atoms. And what's so great about this material? Well, it's incredibly strong. Stronger than diamonds, stronger than alloys of steel. It's transparent, it's light, and it's a fantastic conductor of electricity. This material could be the game changer for many things. Where you actually can see this material being used is the next thing with phones is they are going to go towards foldable phones. So imagine if your phone was that, that thick, and you could crumple it up and just put it in your pocket. And when you want to use your phone, you take it out and you just use it. Now, it's not going to be this big, but it'll be about the same size as a smartphone, but you can crumple it up, put it in your pocket, take it out. Again, you can use it again. No worrying about having to spend money on mobile phone protectors. Why could they do this? Because it's going to be made of graphene. And that's where another application of this material could go. Now, the guy who actually discovered graphene won the Nobel Prize in 2010. His name is Andrea Gein. Ten years before that, he also won the Ig Nobel Prize. It's the funny Nobel Prize. And what he did was he took frogs and he put them in magnetic fields and he watched them float. So he managed to levitate frogs in magnetic fields. So you can see these videos of the frogs just spinning round and round. Now the frog hasn't been damaged, not been harmed, and when they were rewarding, rewarding them the prize, they said, this is great, amazingly, just thinking outside the box research. But he's a bit, he's a bit extravagant, let's to, say, to, to say the least, because a year later, he wrote this paper. It's about gyroscopes. They're used by satellites when they're in orbit around the Earth to position themselves and, and figure out exactly where they are and make sure they're orientated correctly. But he published the paper with his hamster. So let's look at the authors here. That's Andrea Gein. That's, that's the guy who's won the Nobel Prize. And then you got H A M S T E R Tisha, Hamster Tisha. So this guy has published a paper 
with his pet hamster. And the reason he published with his hamsters is because he thought, you know what, my hamster has contributed as much to this work as I have. They deserve credit. And this hamster has 12 citations. I don't know if any other hamster has been cited or referenced by other scientists. I, I've looked through the literature. I don't see any other, other hamsters in publications. Now, this material, graphene, could be used for bulletproof materials. Really actually could. And in this paper from two years ago, they tested it against Kevlar. That's the material that's used in bulletproof vests these days. And also against other alloys of steel. And they found that this material outperforms them all. It is the best option. So in the future, you could see bulletproof materials made with graphene. But if I go a little bit further, imagine a suit that you could wear over your entire body that's maybe one or two atoms in thickness that would make you impenetrable and give you the power of Colossus. And that's thinking a little bit off into the future. Now, another alternative to this bulletproof materials would be spider silk. Now, spider silk is one of the toughest materials on the planet, and it's a natural material. It's a protein, and it's a biomaterial, just like the proteins we produce in our body. Now, people have thought about using spider silk for bulletproof materials for quite some time. But the problem is, how do you get your hands on enough of the stuff? Because you're not going to set up a factory with a million spiders and employ people to pull spider silk out of spiders all day. So the solution is, yes? You might make me kill this spider web. That's what I'm just about to tell you about, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's why I got that there. So what they did was, back in 2002, a group in the United States, they came up with a solution that they would take the DNA of a golden orb weaver spider. They, they actually spin one of the strongest versions of spider silk. They took DNA from that spider. They combined it with goat. They produce a spider goat. And when you, when you milk the goat, it produces, <laughs> it produces spider silk in the milk. And then you can extract the spider silk, and then you send it off to the people who are using it to investigate possibilities with bulletproof materials. Now, I have, I have to ask a question. Anyone here? Would they drink that milk? Yeah. Oh, they got full eggs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. I know. Yeah. But yeah. you wonder, is it ethical? You know. Well, in the United States, they got ethics for the United right. States. So according to, because everyone's oh, countries yeah. are dependent, of course. Yeah. And at that point, yeah. at that time, they were ethically, ethically supported, yeah. uh, and they still are. But so, who would anyone here? Would they drink that milk? I would drink it. No problem. Yeah. Spider silk is a biomaterial. It's protein. Yeah. And it's, yeah, man, yeah, I'll tell you what, we'll get some of this milk soon. Myself and you will sit down and we'll, we'll, we'll have a bit. Yeah, and some goat's cheese as well, yeah, yeah. Sounds good? Great. Now, not only are they looking at uh, making bulletproof materials with this stuff, it could also be used in, uh, for sporting inju injuries because in football, the cruciate ligament is one of the most serious injuries you can ever suffer. And I would wish that on absolutely no one. Touch wood, it's a terrible injury. And I'm a huge, I should not, maybe I shouldn't admit this, I'm a huge Manchester United fan. And, and, oh, yeah, great. And uh, Roy Keane suffered this injury in 1997 when he was playing for Manchester United. Now, the thing is, um, you could spend months recovering from the injury. But, but what if somebody had the unfortunate accident of suffering from a cruciate ligament injury, went into hospital on Friday, then Saturday they have an operation which clears out the old ligament. And on Sunday, then they go in for a second operation where they install a ligament that is entirely made from spider silk. Okay? How many people would like to have spider silk ligaments in the body? I have no problem with it at all. You see? I have no issue. I'll tell you why. Because it's a biomaterial. I told you at the very start, it's a protein. And we are bio materials, fundamentally. And your body can be trained to accept this ligament in the very same way that people take drugs to prevent their body from rejecting organs after organ transplant. Your body can be trained to replenish it and to grow with it. And your ligaments, actually spider silk ligaments, would actually probably be stronger than your own ligaments. So maybe then people will be thinking, actually, can I replace all of my ligaments with spider silk ligaments? But someone has actually developed a bulletproof skin using the spider silk. This is a, a somebody I actually know from Eindhoven. Her name is uh, Shalalia Sadie. And she is a bioartist. She's not a scientist. She's a bioartist, and she thinks outside the box. And what she has done is she has made bulletproof spider silk skin. This is actually bulletproof. She's taken living cells, biological human cells, combined them with spider silk from the spider goats, and she's made this bulletproof skin. And there's a bullet completely stopped by this skin. Now, the, the standard for bullets is, is a mass of 2.6 grams, and 
a velocity of 329 meters per second. It's bulletproof to velocities below that. About, you know, not, not exactly sure, but it's just, it is below it. So they're hoping that maybe in the future that they can tinker with what they've done. But as, a, as, an, as an experiment and as an approach, it is an absolutely exceptional piece of science and thinking outside the box and combining biology with physics and, all, and a number of other subjects. Now, her next project, which she's doing at the moment, and um, it's also fascinating, she's making clothes out of cow manure. So how many people here would wear clothes made out of cow manure? Nobody. No, it doesn't smell like cow manure anymore. I mean, it, not at all. I and mean, she had, even had a fashion show in, in Eindhoven with all of these clothes. Yeah, exceptional. So I got asked the question, who, who'd own a, who wants to own a spider boat? Anyone want one? And you're thinking about it, uh, want one on the back, yeah. But yeah, you definitely, you've got to get a spider boat, yeah. You should be looking for one now as soon as you can get one, right? I'll, ke I'll keep an eye out. If I see one, I'll let you know about it, okay? So invisibility. Someone here mentioned that they wanted to be invisible or the possibility of invisibility. And uh, believe it or not, people are trying to make this happen. Now, there are different ways you can do it. You can put the materials over objects, but this is a cloak. And it will make something appear like it's invisible in microwaves and in different wavelengths. But there is a cheaper option. You see this picture? That's not photoshopped. I haven't changed the picture anyway. This is actually a fully working invisibility cloak. And it's built at the University of Rochester in the United States. And this is a PhD student who's done this as part of his project. And what he's done is he has taken four optical lenses, just like the lenses you find in my glasses, and he's arranged them in a particular way. And if you put an object at a certain location between these lenses, and you look through from one end, it will appear like the object is not there. This is 100% and it absolutely works. It is incredible. And to build this in scientific terms, because I mentioned earlier on, you know that microscope I mentioned, it costs more than half a million euros? You can build this for a thousand euros at home if you wanted to. And the material you can buy online, on the internet, off-the-shelf optical lenses, and it absolutely works. Now the only problem is, okay, you're not really going to carry around four optical lenses, giant lenses all the time, every time you want to become invisible, and then put them in a certain arrangement, and then stand in between them, and then ask somebody to check if you're invisible, because all they got to do to see you is walk around and look from another angle. But what if in the future, let's think, let's think 100 years into the future, that there was a suit that was made from four optical lenses that you could wear that would make you invisible. Think about it this way. When the Wright brothers flew the very first plane, they flew at a height of 10 meters for 60, about a distance of 60 meters. They didn't go to the moon. You've got to start somewhere, right? This is the start in my invisibility suit that I propose that could be built, could be the end goal. And this is how it works, you know, in terms of direction. It's also multi-directional. So if you look from below, straight through, or above, it still looks like it's invisible. It's incredible. And I'm hoping to build this at a conference next year in the Netherlands. So I'm going to be there with all of the physicists from, from the Netherlands. And they're going to come, and I'm going to build this for them so they can see it in action. And if you want to get the instructions for it, it's all on Wikipedia. All the instructions are there to be able to build this yourself. And I'll be putting up details of how this is going and showing some images from it and showing it in action. Now, the Iron Man suit, last, last thing. Sorry, power. could you just go back to that one? Just yeah. I'm just totally confused. Like, what would make you think that if you arrange lenses against one another, that if you looked at a particular angle, that it would, like, where is this? I understand that there's a scientific basis yes, for it, yeah. but, but what on earth would make you think it? How would you come up with that idea? How would you... How do they? How does it work? Like how do they? How did, so what it does is it, it, it uses the fact that when when rays go through a lens, right, mm -hmm. and we have a lens is in our eyes, the eye, the idea is that the lens bends light. So mm -hmm. you'll see this. Best way to describe how light bends is that you know when you put a straw on a glass, and if you look at it from the side, mm -hmm. it looks like the straw. Want the top of the straw is here, but the inside the straw is there. Yeah. So it looks like it's out of alignment. So what they do is they use lenses, the very same way that we have lenses in our eyes, to bend light, focus light onto the retina at the back of our eye. They will use the lenses to bend the light in a certain way. And once you arrange those, those lenses in that, in a very particular way, you can bend the light so that if you place an object at, at a certain location between those lenses, 
that light will never reach and come out at the other end. So when you're looking in from this end, the light gets bent in here somewhere in a way that, it, that if you're at a particular location in between those lenses, you'll never see that object, ever. And it is absolutely incredible. And they've, I've read the paper. I've, I've read the scientific paper because I'm obviously I'm a scientist and I'm, I'm interested. And I want to know if it's right. It, seems, it looks right to me. I mean, I'm, not a, I'm not an optics expert, but I've spoken to optics experts and they agree with what they've done. And it's, it's amazing that, uh, how, how, much they've, uh, how much they've thought outside the box. It's just different thinking. You know, look at, look at, look at it. From, because people are using, are building materials. These me, uh, they're called metamaterials. They're artificial. And they bend light, and they bend, so they bend waves in very, very peculiar ways. Um, and they're really expensive to make. And what they wanted to do is look at something that's, you know, let's, let's look at something what we have in the laboratory, and let's see if we can build something what we have. It's great. It's like Andre Gein with his frog stuff and in, in magnetic fields, just thinking differently about scientific experimentation. And the Iron Man suit, for me, is the ultimate invention. I just told you, I talked about earlier on, uh, I've got three of them in the car. Is it for the, all three of you? You all wanted Iron Man suits, right? Yeah? One, two, two. One of them's broken. Um, the, the rockets, yeah, <laughs> give it to him, is it? The rockets and the boots don't work, so you can only use the, uh, the ones in the hands, that's it. Now, the Iron Man suit is the ultimate uh, invention for me in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and, in, uh, and Tony Stark should be very proud of it. But it can do everything that an airplane can do as well. Think about it, it takes off, it flies, and it lands. Okay, and instead of buying a ticket and getting into it, you put it on. So it's everything that a plane does. And all the technology that's in the Iron Man suit, we already have it. We've got rockets, we've got all those weapons, we've got all that, that artificial intelligence uh, uh, computers. We have um, all of the flight capabilities. We even have the material that it's made of. Because in the film, he said it was made of titanium gold alloy. And that alloy has been made this year, very recently. And it was stumbled upon by accident, as all good things are in science. By accident, they developed this material. But the thing you don't think about with this suit is that it's the ultimate biosensor. For me, in my opinion, this is the ultimate biosensor. I'm going to give you an example of it. This is a scene from Captain America Civil War. Just have a look. Instant diagnosis. So what, 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 the, what the Iron Man suit just told him was that he, she has multiple bruises all over his body and it was instantaneous. And of course he knew that as well because he could feel it. Now imagine a future where you all had Iron Man suits at home that didn't fly, but instead you got into the suit for complete and utter diagnosis of any ailment in your body. No more going to the GP. No more spending money uh, or time waiting, waiting in waiting rooms. No more going to the hospital, maybe. Because this could be the ultimate doctor you'll ever, ever have. Yes? Have you ever seen the movie Big Man Suit? Yes. Yeah, well, that's like, is that not kind of like similar to that you don't wear it? That's someone showing you, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, very, very similar, precisely. That's a great film as well. I thought it was brilliant. Really, really cool. Um, but this is where it can go, and I think we should not even we should not just think about the Iron Man suit as as many people would say. As a, I tell people, here's an Iron Man suit. What are you going to do? Going to fly away? What are you going to do with Iron Man suit? Oh, I'm going to shoot the rockets off. No, you should look at it from a constructive point of view. It is actually an incredible biosensor. Now, all of these superpowers I've spoken about, people aren't actually trying to create these actively right now. If you are, then you're doing it without telling people. And superpowers will emerge as viable spin-offs from research because as scientists and as engineers, we are doing research for the primary reason of trying to create things that will benefit people. And if we, in my opinion, for me particularly, if super superpowers emerge, that would be great. I'd be really happy. But the thing is, once they emerge, we have to make sure that we manage them or else we have situations like this. We have a guy who's got incredible powers like Superman. And we have somebody who believes that they should be micromanaged or 
they should be taken out, Batman, and he decides, you know what? I'm going to take the law into my own hands and take this guy out because I believe that he's far too powerful for the world to be able to deal with him. Because that's what could happen. So we need to make sure we introduce superpowers in a controlled way. And we introduce the laws to manage these powers in, a, in, in, a, in the correct manner so that society is ready for them. But I have to ask a question. If I offer, offer people here right now the opportunity to work at a, a research institute that's called the Secrets of Superhero Science Research Institute, how many people will come and work for me creating superpowers? <coughs> One, two, three. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You would as well? Great. Excellent. So, I got some people going to work for me. But I'll ask another question though. If I gave everybody superpowers right now, how many people would use it for evil? Good. A lot of good people here then. You know? I, I, if I give people, when I say invisibility cloaks, most people say the first thing you're going to do is, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to steal something. Or, or, or another people say, rob a bank. Or some people say, I'm going to go listen to my friends and find out what they really think of me. That's, that's, a, yeah, that's one answer I was given by somebody. But good. All good people. And if some of you are going to come work, or work for me, we're going to create superpowers for good, not for evil. This is a picture of me when I, when I wrote the first book. It was just around the time I was promoting the book. And it combines the two elements of the book. It combines the fact that it's about science. And here I am in a scientific laboratory. And I've got my uh, Spider-Man glove, my mask. I've got the Spider-Man fluid. I've got the spider here. And, uh, of course, i got the, the book there as well. Um, and as I said, I've published another book, which is about uh, Santa Claus. Um, which has come out this year. Now, uh, I have one, just two more things to say. I have uh, on my website a secret page. It's called, um, on my webpage, and you have all the information there, bwscience.com forward slash superhero minus survey. And on that, I have a list of superheroes. And what I want you guys to do, if you get a chance, 30 seconds, just go online, pick your favorite superhero. Because I want people like yourselves to pick the heroes you'd like to see in the next version of this book. So pick the ones that you want to learn about. Pick the ones that you want to hear how close we are to actually creating their powers. And I got one more question for, for, for everybody here. So I actually must say one more question, mainly for the, the younger audience members. So uh, if you don't ask, just put your hand up. So I mentioned a genetic editing tool that I um, could be used to create the X-Men. Does anybody remember what the name of that was? Does anybody remember? So there was a, a, a genetic editing tool, something to modify DNA that could be used to um, used to create the X-Men. Anybody remember? Like four four. So did, any, did anyone, who said that first now? I have to ask mm -hmm. this man here, was it? Yeah, what you say? Oh, I, I, I wasn't, like there were a whole bunch, there was like four initials. Yeah, yeah. Was, the first one was I. Oh yeah, you're thinking about the printer. I think. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. That sounds good to me. I'm going to give you a copy of my book. Then. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Very well. Okay. I hope you've enjoyed what I've had to speak about this evening. Oh, yeah, we've got these as well. I forgot about that. My apologies. So I have to ask. Uh, do we have? Do we have enough for everyone? Do we? No, we don't, unfortunately. So I have to ask. A couple of questions. Couple of questions. Okay. Uh, does anybody know the real name of Iron Man? Well, you once have already said. I'm going to give it to that man. He was. He was next. Okay. Does anyone know um, Batman's real name? Chris Reeve. Oh, the actor. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. There you go. Okay. Chris Wayne. He was Superman. Yeah, he was. Yeah. What was? Uh, what's uh, Superman's real name? Kent. 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 Yeah, we'll be able to. We'll be able to. We'll be able to younger. We'll be able to younger members of the audience here with this one. I think. Um, yeah. There you go. Right. And I'm gonna ask one more question. Who else wants? Do you want Spider Goat? Don't you? You definitely want Spider Goat. Have to. I do want because I know Spider Goat as well. I'm gonna give you this. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have.
Yes. Well, as uh, you know, I appreciate you picking me because these geniuses here in front of me and, and this man here, you know, their, their knowledge of superheroes is far beyond me. But do you not think that the American, C you know, the American CIA and the Chinese and Russians have developed a, a lot of this already? It could very well. That's the whole point of secret agency. Yeah, it's and the scientists are just catching up. So they might have a, a spider elephant or something, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. massive but tons but of they, they, they could have, yeah. they could have the Iron Man suit already built. Yeah. But I'll tell you, there are people working on building Iron Man suits. There's a company, this is all sound very strange, there's a company in Japan called Cyberdyne. Anyone know Cyberdyne? Where did you hear Cyberdyne before? Anybody know? Robocop? No. Oh, sorry, uh, Terminator. Terminator, yeah. <laughs> so Cyberdyne was the company that built Terminator at Skynet, and Cyberdyne in Japan are building a, an exoskeleton to help people with spinal injuries um, walk again, and it's called HAL 5. And HAL is the evil robot in Space Odyssey 2001. So it's very, 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 very strange. I mean, that's the level they're at, but I do, I do agree with you. They could have this stuff under lock and key already done. There's nothing, I mean, I don't know. I have no information to suggest that, that they do. I have none to say they don't. But you do know it's possible. It's everything I've presented. I've presented possible here. I haven't presented improbable. I haven't presented things that I think are maybe going to happen. I've presented stuff that will happen. Yeah. And if I think, it's I think it will happen, then, then other people also think it's going to happen. Yes? I don't know. Do you know why you're talking about this here and all that? The best thing you can say. Like there's both mutations, there's both the mutations in the same already. The mutation is just a quick failure and it's free to develop in some sort of different way. Brilliant, yeah, yeah. So some people here could actually have superpowers, but they don't actually know they have superpowers. I'll give you an example. There's an ultra marathon runner. So I run marathons. I've done seven marathons and I've done one ultra marathon, 50 kilometer race. I did it, I was really happy. All I wanted to do was finish it. It took me about five hours to do it. I just wanted to finish it because it was the furthest I've ever run. And yeah, I know my limit. My limit is about that. I mean, there's this guy who can keep running and won't get tired. He's just lactic acid in his legs. He doesn't have any potential you, benefit. You know the story, and, yeah? Do you know his name? Uh, no. Dean Carnassus. Okay. So Dean Carnassus, you're absolutely right. He's got this issue with his, with his lactic acid production. He has a mutation, effectively, that his muscles process lactic acid faster than he can build up. And because that's what gives you cramps in your muscles. So when you do a lot of exercise, and that's why you get the cramps. And in, in the marathon, that's why they talk about people hitting the wall at around 20 miles or 32 kilometers. It's because of this lactic acid buildup. Now, the reason he doesn't have it is because he's got, um, he's, uh, let's say, in his muscles, he's got uh, basically the ability to clear this lactic acid faster than it's actually building up. Now, to put this in perspective, I'll just tell you the distance this guy's run. He has run 560 kilometers nonstop in 72 hours. He has run 50 marathons in the 50 states of the United States in 50 consecutive days, and he ran his fastest marathon on the last day with three hours at the New York Marathon. He has run the Bad Water, he's run this many times like many other people, but the Bad Water 135 uh, Ultra Marathon. It's an ultra marathon that takes place in California. You start during the day, it's about 50 degrees Celsius, and it's so hot that if you run in the middle of the road, your shoes melt. So you run uh, on the white lines. And sometimes when he's running, he wears a white suit because he wants to get all the heat off his body and he wants to keep as cool as possible. And once he was running, he was about 80 kilometers into the race, I think it was his first one. And his parents normally act as the support van for him. So he's running along and the van pulls up and he goes, I gotta eat. Now he, he really couldn't eat. He just couldn't actually keep anything down, but he needed energy. So they handed him a peanut butter sandwich and he's running, he's not even running, he's probably doing this beside the van. And he was doing that for two minutes, and he looked down at his sandwich, and he turned to his father, and he said, why did you give me a toasted peanut butter sandwich? I didn't. What happened was, sandwich toasted in his hand while he was running. And when he trains, he runs with his credit card. So you're thinking, why does he do that? He's got his phone and his credit card. Three o'clock in the morning, he's into a 75 mile kilometer training run, picks up the phone, rings the pizza place. Okay, meet me here, I'll be there in 30 minutes and he continues on his run. Gets to this location, he arrives there, they bring him a giant pizza, he takes the pizza out of the box, rolls it up, 
Okay, that's the pizza. He might get a cheesecake as well. And he also runs with one of these bladder bags and, he, and they ask, ask for a giant coffee. And you might think that's all the worst stuff that you could ever give anyone when they're running. Not when you're running, when your plan is to run another 50 or 60 kilometers. So he, he, he has the pizza in one hand and he continues running, eating it like it's a giant burrito. And he's running along with a cheesecake in the other hand. This guy is incredible. There's a relay race in California. He has run the race by himself. Normally you run with 15 other people and the race is 220 kilometers. I'm not sure of the exact distance. But he's run it by himself and he's beaten half the teams. What sort of pace is he running? So when he's doing the 560 kilometer run, yeah. he was doing about 9, 10k uh, an hour. Really? Okay, yeah. yeah. And when he's doing the bad water, which is about 180 kilometers, um, but, you know, to, to give it, put it in perspective, you start out below sea level, in the driest part of the planet, and in the first uh, first six kilometers, you probably climb about a uh, thousand, thousand meters, more, maybe a bit more than that. But there's a huge change, and the first time he did the race, everything's, you know, first, first five, six hundred meters, he's running along, it's really hot, and then six kilometers in, he's up in the mountains, and he's looking around with all the other runners, they've all got gloves on. Why? Change the temperature. Change the temperature. They're crawling through snow. That's how much of a difference there was. And he didn't bring gloves the first time he did it, and he was absolutely freezing. Yes? He, he can, but we have the thing is your muscle, your muscles are part of a, your body, which is a huge system. You have all these systems working together, and if one develops faster than the other then it could lead to detrimental effects for another. So the, the one I'm thinking of is his skeleton. That if, he's, if his skeleton doesn't also develop to match what his muscles are doing, then in later life, he's going to have serious structural problems because his muscles will be pulling and dragging at, 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 his, um, at his skeleton. And if he does something in the wrong way and if his muscles overdevelop in a certain part, it could, be def it could be really bad for him. I'll give you an example, the flash. <laughs> When the flash runs, <coughs> he's running so fast that in reality, as he runs, his legs should fly off. They really should. So what he must have as well is that he must have extremely strong and powerful ligaments and tendons and muscles. And obviously his skeleton, skeleton structure has also been augmented or increased in strength. Because if he doesn't have all that, his arms fly off, his legs fly off, he can't run like that. There's no way he can do it. And how come there aren't similar implications to that runner you were just talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, if he doesn't produce this like to get he's, that he's not running that fast. He didn't even tell you he's not the fastest. Oh, no, I'm not saying I'm not yeah. saying the same implications. Yeah. So why aren't there implications of some sort or other? Oh yeah, I mean he's he, you know, there must be are his knees no. His knees his knees are good. He, yeah, he I mean, went I mean, are there they're not some parts of his skeleton that's suffering. What's the point of the lactic acid, I suppose? Yeah. You, say? you know, why well, do we feel that kind of pain? Because well, like like everything, in normal circumstances. Well, like everything, we produce waste. I mean, we produce waste when we use a car. Our body produces waste, and the lactic acid is just the waste that's produced by muscles as it processes uh, glucose and and other whatever other uh, source of energy you're going to be using. And the, for us, lactic acid is when it builds up normally because that's normal waste product that's produced as you do exercise. We feel cramped immediately. Now, the benefit for him is that. He doesn't develop this lacti lac lactic acid buildup in the same way we do, and his muscles clear it out faster than, than normal, which is great for him, but you're absolutely right. He went to the doctor at some point in his career, and they said, your knee is in bad trouble, or whatever, and they said, you need to rest, give him medication. And do you know what he did when he came out of the doctors? Took the medication in the bin. He's still running. The guy's in his 50s, he's about 51, 52. He has just written a book about the marathon because obviously he's, he's called the ultra marathon man. He's not even the, the best in the world. But you know what he's the best at? He's the best marketing person in the world because his background was in marketing before he became a professional ultra marathon runner. Mm -hmm. So he markets himself fantastically, but he's not even the fastest. He, he can't even, he can, he can run incredible distances, but there are people out there who can run further than him. Yeah? Well, what's his fastest marathon? Oh, he's a he's about a. I mean, he did the the, the New York Marathon in three hours. That in that 50, right, 50 marathons, fifty states. Yeah, but I think he's fastest. I'm I'm guessing. I wouldn't I wouldn't say. I'm pretty sure he's done sub three hours. I'm sure he's done two 
250 or 255. And what age was he when he started all this? He, he did running when he was a, a young, he gave it up. He ended up going into business. He was working in his business and he was doing all this. And then one day he was out at a party, I think it was his 30th birthday, and he, um, he, he, he just came home and had an epiphany and he thought, you know what, I'm done with all this. Pushed to the side, pulled his runners out of his, out of his cupboard, and then he went out and ran 30 miles in the middle of the night and then rang his wife and said, she said, where are you, you know, are you okay? I'm out uh, somewhere, you'll have to come collect me. Why, I can't come back, I'm exhausted. That was his first run, so he ran a marathon more than a marathon as his first run when he got back into it.